Um, welcome everybody, conscious that people still keep coming in as we start here, but um, thanks very much for being here for our third webinar in the Social Data in Action um, series. And today we are super excited to have Sarah Williams from uh, MIT with us today. And uh, her talk is going to be about um, social data for public empowerment in the US and possibly other places since there are <laughs> there's a number of um, slides in there. So um, Sarah is an associate professor of technology and urban planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she is also director of the Civic Data Design Lab and the Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism. Sarah combines her training in computation and design to create communication strategies that expose urban policy issues to broad audiences and create civic change. Um, she calls this process data action, which is also the name of her recent book published by MIT Press, which is truly awesome. And uh, she's gonna draw on some of that today. So, so thank you for being here, Sarah. Uh, it's evening time in New York where, where Sarah is. So obviously it's early morning for us. So people are dribbling in. Um, Paul, next slide. So uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and acknowledge all of the uh, traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all working today and present today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I wanna pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters. Okay, so um, Sarah's gonna speak for a while, um, maybe up to half an hour or so. And um, we encourage you to put questions or comments into the chat as you go. Um, but we will leave all of the questions and handling of these questions and chat till the end. Um, at that point, uh, we might ask you to ask your question um, or you might want to raise your hand and ask a question spontaneously. Um, we will be recording this session. And if you have any challenges with being recorded, then please get in touch with Paul, um, who's on here, and um, paullevy at swinburne.edu.au. So um, thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to Sarah. Great. Um, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. And also, thank you for inviting me to join you from way far away. Um, can't imagine. So I feel very lucky to be able to join you all or the pandemic has created this lucky situation so that I can speak with you today. Um, so um, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, let me just share my screen. See. Just going to organize it so that I can see my notes. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, I'm an associate professor of technology and urban planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where I also direct the Civic Data Design Lab and the Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism. The LCAU is a cross-disciplinary center which combines the research of architecture, urban planning, landscape architecture, and systems thinking, not about the problems of yesterday, but of tomorrow. We are motivated by radical changes in our environment and the role that design and research can play in addressing these. I myself am very interdisciplinary. I combined um, uh, training uh, as a geographer, architect, urban planner, and data scientist. And I really combine these skills to take data into action. I believe multidisciplinary teams are essential for using data for action as they help contextualize the work within the broader policy arena communicate it results more broadly 
and allow for new innovation. These teams bring their diverse training to the table. Here is an example of a team I brought together from work I did in Nairobi, Kenya. We include a computer scientists, architects, policy experts, data scientists, uh, people from NGOs um, such as the World Bank are also included. And I think it's really um, impactful what we can do together. So what do I mean by data for action? I'm going to use an example of a project which is now close to 15 years old, um, but had such a great impact. A project which I did with Laura Kurgan, Eric Fedora, David Freinford, and myself, uh, who was a data scientist at the time. Um, in this project, we took data from the criminal justice system of where people lived before they went to prison. We added it up block by block, and those red blocks show where it costs over a million dollars to incarcerate people. When you zoom in, you find whole communities such as this one, where $17 million is spent to incarcerate people. How could this money be spent to alleviate the systematic reasons for mass incarceration was the question we all asked ourselves. The maps expose our response to poverty is incarceration rather than prevention. Uh, we took these maps um, to the Center for Architecture in New York, where we also showed maps of 10 other cities. We asked the community, policy experts, uh, urban planners, uh, criminal justice advocates, um, if they had just 1 million of that dollar, how might they reinvest it in the community? So the idea here is if we spent just a million dollars on better education or better healthcare, it might alleviate the systematic reasons that people uh, enter the prison system to begin with. Um, the images were seen in the Architecture League by um, the Museum of Modern Arts curator who asked to include them in an exhibition. Um, they were seen on the walls by a congressman who asked if he could use them uh, for evidence in the Criminal Justice Reinvestment Act of 2010 and 2020, which allocated $25 million uh, to reentry program. Um, and while this is just a drop in the bucket, if we look at that $17 million, it shows how by bringing data to broad groups of people, we can change minds and hopefully policy. This is a great example of the data action methodology because communicating with data in this way requires the ability to ask the right questions, find or collect the appropriate data, analyze and interpret that data and visualize the results in a way that can be understood by broad audiences. Combining these methods transforms data from a simple point on a map to a narrative that has meaning. Data is not often processed in this way because data analysts are often not familiar with the techniques that can be used to tell stories with data ethically and responsibly. And my book seeks to do that. I wanna just note that you know one of the reasons I use this project is also because even though it's close to 15 years old, it, been coming up on my Instagram and news feeds quite often in the conversations in the United States around defunding the police, um, much so because the message in a way was about that. Um, how do we reallocate fiscal um, funding uh, to things that can help alleviate the systemic issues rather than focus on uh, policing? <clears throat> so data action isn't just my methodology, it's also a recent, my recent book that was released uh, in December. Um, and data action was really started with the premise um, that in the last decade, we've created unprecedented amounts of data, which 
is only set to increase by tenfold, largely developed by private companies such as this data set from a Google's autonomous vehicles, which creates points every second, as you can see here. And while not all of the data is closed, like the previous example, all the excitement from civic hackers to consulting groups such as McKinsey left me with a pain on my side. Did these groups know the ways in which data intentionally or unintentionally can cause harm? Did they know how their excitement to do good might be marginalizing or reinforce um, um, or forget whole populations? And while criticism began to mount from academics about the potential misuse of data, as you can see in these examples above, and rightfully so, I found we needed a way to show people how to use data ethically and responsibly. I found we needed to explain to data enthusiasts, my MIT students alike, the ways in which we could use data um, for empowerment rather than oppression. Um, so I decided to develop data action, which I believe presents a corrective standard to data practices by acknowledging that data represents the ideologies of those who control its use. Uh, data action at its heart was developed for data enthusiasts and novices, civic hackers, urban planners, and policy experts to provide guidance for using data ethically and responsibly. Data action asks advocates of big data to rethink how they work with data to make the process more responsible to the people their work affects. So in the first chapter of data action, big data for cities is not new. I position the reader within this larger narrative by providing a historical account of the ways those in power have used data to shape our cities, how they have reinforced structural racism, how data has helped enforce the marginalization of various populations. At the same time, I illustrate the many benefits that analyzing data has provided societies, such as establishing social services and stopping the spread of disease. The juxtaposition of these two outcomes provides a reminder that the person analyzing the data defines its use. And so in this chapter, one of the many things I talk about um, is gerrymandering. And I talk about a character in the United States uh, called Thomas Hoffletter, who um, has pushed around data to help create Republican districts um, in the US and is often considered the reason that the Republican Party has been so dominant in the past years. A self-professed data nerd, he started his work since the first digital census came out in 1970 and has systematically used it to push around congressional districts towards the Republican favor. Um, so uh, one of the things that I mentioned that he does in the book um, <clears throat> is he creates um, in the 80s um, all black congressional districts under the auspices of civil rights saying that uh, African Americans should have their own districts. But what this actually did is consolidate blacks into districts, uh, decreasing the, their vote and their ability to make more diverse districts. Um, one of the main reasons that we see a heightened amount of Republican uh, districts across the United States. A recent discovery of Hoffleter's personal notes from his computer confirmed how he used data for the Republican ad advantage, redistricting and creating districts that he hoped would subvert those on the margins. Um, in this chapter, I talk about um, characters like Hoffleter, but I also talk about uh, characters from public health that really helped improve society using data as evidence. Um, 
It's not surprising given all the hype swirling around massive amounts of data in today's world that some essential data is still missing. This missing data usually represents the interests and needs of those on the margins of society, but it also represents topics that governments and companies seek to keep hidden. Chapter two, Build It challenges us communities and data specialists alike to create the data needed to encourage policy action. The examples in Build It show that today, anyone can go about collecting data with very little training. This is because innovations in digital technology make it easier than ever to collect personal data. From our mobile devices to environmental sensors in our home, modern life is full of tools to measure aspects of our lives. And it's up to us to understand the data we need, how to use these technologies to develop narratives that can make an impact on policy. Um, in this chapter, I show a project in Beijing. Um, and this is a project that I did during the Olympics with the Associated Press to expose the extremely poor air quality, which is now famous uh, in Beijing. Um, <clears throat> and when it might be surprising to you to know that there were no air quality measurements being given out by the government during the Olympics. And we developed a sensor, which was the only uh, tool that measured air quality um, during the Olympic Games. Um, here you can see the red represents Beijing and the measurements of particulate matter are far above the World Health Organization for developing country and far above what you see in New York and London um, uh, on the same day. The Associated Press translated these into data visualizations that they sold to their subscribers. Um, and the information was also included in the New York Times. And really the idea of this project was to show um, the impact of air quality and use the Olympics as a global stage uh, to help bring this issue to broad uh, groups of people that might not have been aware of it. Although data collection is important, this chapter um, also explains how building data together strengthens communities around their shared interests. Building sensors, learning about data measurements, and collaborating with one another creates the bonds necessary to create change. Build It inspires us to create our com own community data collection projects, not only because they can literally change our community, but also because they can help create new communities like this one, which was created in Louisiana during the oil spill to make sure the government did the proper cleanup. While Build It describes how to collect missing data and use it to fill gaps in knowledge, Hackett shows that oftentimes data already exists openly, although we might not see it that way because it's stored, maintained by private companies. In some countries where data is tightly controlled by the government who produces it, privately owned data is the only data that exists openly for analyzing the dynamics of our lives. This third chapter argues that we ought to be creative in the ways that we obtain data to answer important questions about society. Nonetheless, acknowledging that data acquired for one purpose and applied towards another holds numerous ethical concerns that must be considered. Data action provides guidance for those who seek to use data openly. Um, so, um, in this project, we look at the, or in this chapter, one of the examples is looking at the issue of ghost cities. If you're not familiar with ghost cities, they are developments that lie vacant um, and mapping vacant residential developments can identify risk in the Chinese real estate market. But data about vacant developments are not available through the government, are not widely available at all, in fact, are really important to planning, but also to the global marketplace to assess the risk 
Um, so we decided to create a model that tried to identify where these Dakin developments exist. And our model is based on the idea that uh, thriving community needs amenities, schools, places to go grocery shopping, banks, um, entertainment. Um, and if we were to have that, um, we might have a thriving community. Given that data is hard to come by, we scrape data from the Chinese Yelp um, or Dan Ping. And then we got residential locations from AMAP and Baidu's API. We overlaid a grid of 300 by 300 cell cells um, to mark residential locations. And then we took the center of each cell and measured its distance to the various amenities. Uh, we took into account whether an amenity had a review to determine whether that's something that people actually went to. Um, and then once we had this, we applied the Hansen's gravitational model that measures urban accessibility, which takes into account um, that we, if we live in the suburbs, we would travel further to get to an amenity. Um, we uh, find the mean of the fitted distribution and then we remove the cells uh, that are above the mean. And then we perform spatial autocorrelation on those highest amenity scores, um, thinking that those that cluster are likely to be ghost cities. Um, and then we, one of my methods is I really think you need to ground truth your data. So we went to Shendu, Chenzhen, and Xi'an to see how well we did. Um, and we found things like this. Um, uh, developments that um, were built maybe five to 10 years ago in which the government would say people will eventually move there. The idea is that um, the government thinks it's better to have the economic growth that comes with the construction and allow them to lie vacant until uh, people will move in. Uh, we also found uh, a number of stalled construction sites next to partially occupied um, housing. In this particular case, the occupation was by those who previously uh, lived in the village um, in which these housing were redeveloped. We found older housing blocks, um, communist housing blocks that were being readied for removal and redevelopment. And then we found whole um, cities um, that lie vacant, um, such as this one, and this was meant to be the science center. I should note that you know, some of these vacant developments lie vacant, but completely sold because uh, the Chinese government, Chinese citizens often buy four or five homes. This is encouraged by the government um, and was a tool for investment before the Chinese stock market existed. Um, so in the first example, those homes might have been completely sold, but lie vacant. Um, a kind of thing that China has uh, kind of replicated in many places. Um, so we decided to create a data visualization that helped to explain the model. So when you click on each cell, it tells you um, how that cell's amenity score was created. So here, there's great distance from malls, from schools, um, and from uh, banks, which is one of the reasons that this particular location had a high amenity score. Um, and we showed uh, this map to planners. And what was really important about this is they became much more forthcoming about the reasons for these developments. And we were able to create trust um, through them. Vacant developments are controversial to local politics and that the decisions were based mostly on theory and not open data, says these planning directors. But the real estate um, 
Developers also told us that the bubble of real estate in China might have irreversible impacts on residents and that the mismatch between supply and demand would be a big problem looming ahead. Um, and I think that this kind of verification really helped us to create what I would consider the next foreclosure map, um, showing us where there's risk in the market and the potential for houses to be foreclosed upon. And as I said, one of the things that we like to do in the Civic Data Design Lab is really bring our projects to new audiences. So um, we brought this project to the Seoul Biannual uh, where we presented the data visualizations um, linked with drone footage that we took on site um, to allow more people to understand the phenomenon that has now been exported many places across the world. While Hackett asked us to innovatively find, acquire, and analyze data for policy change by communicating the results of those analytics ingenuously, um, Chapter 4 Share it stresses the importance of sharing data both in its raw form and also through visualizations. Sharing data helps the public have access to information, acquire knowledge, and ultimately make better civic decisions. Sharing data through visualizations can communicate the insights of data without asking everyone to be data scientists. Um, so in this um, project, um, we use the example of Nairobi. And in Nairobi, matatus or buses you see here are the main form of transit for 3.5 million people. Yet when I started working in Nairobi, there was not information about where these buses went, not even a map. This data is essential for planning and creating transportation models, but also can leverage to develop applications that can help decrease congestion that plagues the city as exhibited here. While matatus are essential for the operation of the city, the government had no data about where they were. Um, this is very familiar to me. I started uh, working in Nairobi by creating the first GIS data set using machine learning from satellite data. Um, and so for this project, um, we really thought, how could we create um, a data set for our model, but a data set that everyone could use? And we thought, could we leverage the ubiquitous nature of cell phone use in Nairobi China to capture that data about an informal transit system, which most citizens depend upon and open that data for anyone to use and build upon. Um, so our research team collaborated with the University of Nairobi Computer Science Department to develop an application that collected data on the routes and stops. Our collaboration with the university was important because we wanted the local knowledge on how applications are used, but more importantly, we wanted the knowledge of how to build these systems to stay in Nairobi. The collaboration of skills allowed for a transfer of knowledge between cultures. Um, we collected the data using uh, the GTFS data sander, which is the same standard that Google Maps use to route you on public transport. It's a simple format that holds latitude and longitude data, which draws the network of Matatu system as volunteers uh, collect the data passes. And you can see here, it's building the road network in Nairobi. Developing a visualization that would allow the public to understand the complexity of this system became a challenge. And we began to play with the data to determine ways to visualize the information. Um, we, get, we began by giving each corridor a color and legend. Still, it was still hard to see the multiple overlapping routes. Ultimately, we decided to create a stylized map, much the same that you would see in New York, London, Paris, even Boston. And the map was edited with Matatu drivers, owners, the government, and collaborators. Um, and the collaborative yes, way... Yes, um, that we created this data really helped to build trust um, in the data set. And here you can see them planning in the north where you see there's not a lot of routes and they're discussing why that is um, and instantly using the map as a planning tool. We held workshops to 
get a sense if users would be able to read the maps. Um, and we performed community engagement with the Matatu drivers, owners, um, and riders. Um, ultimately, the maps went viral on the internet and social media. Newspapers published them as inserts so that people without phones uh, could have access to them. And one of the things that I like to talk about when I talk about that project is how do you measure success in an open data project? And I think that's when others leverage the data we created to generate their own policy change. And so we were really excited when the government invited us to a press conference um, to make the map, the official map of the city. And what I think is important about this is while they were largely disinterested in all along the way, when they saw the benefit of the map, they were included in the data collection process. They felt like it, they could trust it so much so it is now uh, the official map of the city. It was the first informal transit navigable on Google Maps. And we, uh, we have now helped 40 other cities do the same. Because the map became an iconic symbol of the city, the World Bank copied our visualization to create their bus rapid transit map. Um, they wanted to piggyback on the popularity of our visualization. We have worked together with the local technology community and there are now five apps that use um, our data as a base. Semi-formal transit provides mobility around the world, not just in Nairobi, but the majority of cities outside the US and Europe use these systems. And many of these cities have followed our lead from Anan to Managua, we now have a network of many cities that we've helped um, uh, develop this data. Chapter five, data as a public good. I believe it's important to think of data as a public good, a non-rivalous commodity that can be valued by all who consume it. A commodity similar to electricity, which needs regulation so it can be used equitably by the public. Society should work with private companies to find ways for them to share the data ethically and responsibly so that we can use data towards the betterment of society. In this chapter, I discuss how, you know, we are actually missing a lot of data and Africa is a great example of that. Um, so much so that the World Bank has said it could lead to the denial of basic rights and became an important component for every part of the sustainable development goals, which emphasize the need for that particular goal to collect data. Yet with all of this lack of data, it's surprising that data actually exists. Um, but it exists in the hands of people like Facebook and Google. So the fifth and final chapter reminds us that in a rapidly growing data landscape, there is a growing divide between the people who have access data and those who do not. And while data was once something that only landowners and governments controlled, now private companies are accumulating exponential amounts every day. Some believe this amounts to data colonialism where private companies extract our data as a resource and use it as a tool for control. Putting the idea of data colonialism aside for a moment, I believe it's important to think of data as a public good um, and that we could actually use this to improve society. So um, in this uh, example, I took Facebook activity data to identify areas in Nairobi that lacked proper internet connections. And here we see uh, many of the low income communities um, outside the CBD experience uh, um, very low ability to connect. Um, the value of using this Facebook data can help us develop um, infrastructure, but we know that infrastructure development is also means social development. These maps led uh, me to a project called the Living Data Hubs, which is a project that creates a community-owned, community-built um, 
data collection tool and wireless network in Kibera, uh, which we installed um, wireless hubs uh, during COVID uh, to increase internet connections, using our map as a guide to the neediest locations. Um, so I'm gonna leave us with the data action principles that I left everyone in the book with. Um, while each story I tell in the book explains this, I wanna leave you with some final thoughts. First, um, number one, do no harm. We must interrogate the reasons we want to use data and determine the potential for our work to do more harm than good. Build teams. Building teams to create narratives around data for action is essential for communicating the results effectively. And I think the Nairobi example is a great example of that. Change power dynamics. Building data helps change the power dynamics inherent in controlling and using data while also having numerous side benefits such as teaching data literacy. Again, the Nairobi example is great. Collecting data where the government isn't and then having them use it is such an empowering tool for the Matatu drivers and owners. Expose hidden systems. Coming up with unique ways to acquire, quantify, and model data can expose messages previously hidden from the public eye. However, we must expose ideas ethically, going back to the first principle of doing no harm. So here, we expose the system of vacant properties, but we also showed examples of exposing hidden systems uh, with a million dollar blocks project. Five, ground truth. We must validate the work we did with data by literally observing the phenomenon on the ground, asking those it affects to interpret the results. We saw that in all my projects, including the ghost cities, but also Matatu projects, really asking the people involved and in the map whether we whether what we interpret rings true. Sharing data. Sharing data is essential for communicating the need for policy change and generating debates essential for that work. We can't all be data scientists, but we can read uh, um, designs communicated with data. And I believe that's one way that we create open data sets. Create your own ethical standards. Remember that data are people and we must do them no harm. We must seek to develop our own ethical standards and call others to do so. And really one of the things that I'm thinking about here is that technology develops much more rapidly um, than our ethics can be applied to. And it's up to us uh, to create those ethical standards. So I leave you here. Data action sets out to remind us that big data in its raw form cannot perform on its own. Rather, it's how, how data is transformed and operationalized that can change the way we speak, see the world. More specifically, data can be used for civic action and policy change. Thank you very much. And I'll open it up for questions. Thanks so much, Sarah such an enlightening, um, fascinating talk and, and run through of a huge body of work um, that has had clearly a massive impact in a lot of parts of the world. Um, I'm, I'm just going to kind of help coordinate questions and I'd really like us to have some discussion. There's some, some good people that I can see in the crowd gathered today to um, who are working in this space or around this space. Um, but I might, I, I have a lot of questions myself. So I think I'll, I'll just jump in with one and I'm sure you've preempted and you have an answer for this question, but it just picks up on that last um, point around creating ethical standards uh, and the pace of change with technology and, and in particular with, with data and data sharing um, practices in Australia at the moment. Um, the federal government has had a couple of years of going through um, some work around regular or new forms of regulating data sharing, um, but particularly amongst the public sector and how that that public sector data might move outwards into the private sector is essentially how it's positioned. Um, 
But one of the, and, and alongside that, there's a lot of work obviously in, in creating ethical standards and imposing those um, sometimes as regulations, sometimes just as guidelines or principles. And I'm just wondering about your thoughts around, you mentioned at one point repurposing data. So, you know, using open data, for example, for alternative purposes um, to, to what that data was um, collected for. The, the question that I have and grapple with all the time is how much do the protections of data and data rights and, and you know, personal sovereignty and care um, for people, how much do they, do those protections impose challenges on the way that we might use data for social good or, you know, do all of the things that, that you've done um, with data, for example, and, and if you have even any way through that conundrum um, or any ideas around that, it'd be great to, to hear your thoughts. Um, I think this is a really good question, something that we're thinking about all the time. Um, I think um, in some of the examples that I showed where we're using data sets that are openly available, maybe produced for one purpose, um, and then I use them for another, um, the things that I think about is, um, have I aggregated enough, um, the data to remove personal identification? So I think a lot of times when people are using like Twitter data in that way, they're actually still exposing the individual. Um, and I think that that is problematic, um, rather than let's say taking the data in a more aggregated uh, format. Um, I think also in each one of those projects, like um, where I do, let's say, scrape Twitter data, um, I also go through a ground truthing process with the community. Um, and I guess when I talk about ground truthing, I, I mean really asking those inside the data who made the data if what I have observed ranked rings true to them, but also if it has any potential to harm those communities. And I think that part of ground truthing is really um, important in that process that I went through in Ghost Cities uh, was an important part of that um, conversation with, with Chinese community who could have been very defensive, but also actually like used it as a, a conversation point. Um, I also talked to like in that case, we actually told Dan Ping that we were taking our data. So I always inform. So in Twitter projects and Dan Ping and like the AMAP, we've, we informed them that we would scraping the data in that way. Um, so just to, I mean, even though it's, let's say like typically against their terms, like they usually don't have a problem with it. Um, but um, because it is publicly available. And I think oftentimes they want to, to see it be used for good. Um, I imagine others might contact them and they wouldn't allow for that kind of scraping. I'm not sure, but I do feel like it's important in my own ethical practice to make sure I reach out and make those contacts with um, the data providers to let them know. And that can be useful in helping highlighting bias um, in the data sets as well. Great, thanks. Um, we've got a question from, from Anne. Um, Anne, did you want to jump on and, and ask the question yourself? We mute off. <laughs> oh, sorry, Anne, it sounds like you're on mute still. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, um, I had the um, uh, initial question, which was around the methodology slide that you put up um, very early on, uh, which included things like ground truthing, opening up data, so different types of data and so on. So I was interested in hearing a bit more about them. And you've explained more about what you meant by the ground truthing data. I thought it was a, a very interesting sort of a series or way of differentiating different types of data and how to intervene and engage with it. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that as a from a methodology point of view. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so whenever I work on a project, I really start by building the team that can answer the right questions. In fact, I'm just starting a project right now with the World Food Program to look at issues around migration from the Central tri Triangle um, in Central America to the U US. Um, and so, you know, we've built a team that includes like the Migration Center, the um, other kinds of policy experts, but also like a data scientist, um, architects and designers, as we begin to ask the questions um, and then actually acquire the data. So next step is acquiring the data um, and collecting it or analyzing it or gathering it. So like in the Twitter cases, I'm gathering it or scraping it. In this case, we're doing a survey of 5,000 migrants um, from the Central Triangle. Um, then analyzing that data is the process that we're going through right now interpreting the results and then ultimately visualizing it is what we really want to do for the UN Assembly Council and, and, and finding out uh, ways that we can communicate new insights about what's going on in this migration pattern um, ultimately. Um, and as we do that work, we're going to ground truth our um, analytics with people and the migrants within the data visualizations and ask them, uh, both to interpret or tell us about our results, but also we'll be doing video interviews with them, um, asking them um, to, to analyze, which we hope those videos will be part of the larger communication strategy of what's going on with the migrants coming from the Central Triangle, which is Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Um, and always as we do projects, uh, we've gained new insights from these ground truthing processes um, that really ch often change the graphics or change the kind of data we want. Um, and our teams kind of rethink it and the iteration begins again. So that's kind of why I think of it as a cyclical process um, as analyzing data really never, never ends, um, but um, it's a contribution constant process of uh, evaluation. Yeah, thank you. I, I did have, I just wondered too, whether, have you used these approaches in, uh, I guess, smaller settings like uh, organizational settings, for example, or do you tend to work at this very large, bigger picture level? <coughs> we work with small organizations and big organizations. Um, okay. Yeah, it depends on, the project. Um, so essentially the same process, but scaled yeah. down as needed. Yeah. And typically like in an organizational setting, those teams are already there in a way, right? You have your policy person, you have probably somebody who knows data a little bit. You might need to bring in a designer um, to help visualize it, but I think it's scales down and scales up um, as it were. Okay, thanks. Speaking of scaling up and scaling down, Jane, did you want to jump in with a question as well around that? Yeah, sure. Obviously, I've got heaps of questions, but um, um, my question is really around um, like the project you showed us are all great. And I think we are quite passionate about engaging the public with the idea that there are data out there, there are data that they have. have generated or are, are significantly represented in. Um, I was just wondering if you can sort of give us any tips or, or big picture thoughts, maybe even about how to roll out that kind of engagement of the public with data. It, in some of our projects, it seems that there's two approaches to data. One is like super fear that, um, that their data are going to be out there and on the other hand a bit of an apathetic kind of perspective um yeah so so i'm kind of wondering how do we how do we sort of scale up and roll out this kind of idea of being able to engage the public more with with data um so i think that um like in all of the projects that I did, I tried to create, let's say like this public interface 
with the data and it, it like often just depends on the project, right? So um, like oftentimes that's like an, I like to do interactive websites, which allows um, the public to actually be using it, playing around with it, um, doesn't take expertise, but also allows them to find their own knowledge in the work that you've presented. Um, so that's one way that I think is really effective um, uh, for engaging the public within your data set. But I think perhaps you're also talking about um, like the public's like fear of like say sharing the data in the, the first place. Um, yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm kind of thinking that, you know, you showed us lots of projects I mean, obviously projects are great, but like, how do we kind of scale up that whole idea of engaging the public with data? I'm wondering, is there a role for NGOs or councils or community health organizations that collect, they collect lots and lots of data. I mean, they maybe haven't grappled with what to do with it themselves, but ultimately, hopefully they will. And then, then they really, I guess, one argument would go need to engage the people who've produced the data in those conversations or you know how how they can get benefit from data so how how do we go about that do do organizations in the US kind of do that kind of thing like engage their end users with the data that they generate at all absolutely i think that organizations um absolutely engage the, the public users with data. Um, I think that lots of, they like go about it in lots of different ways. I think most often it's with like shorter tidbits, things that are maybe post can be posted on social media um, and can, you know, like even the million dollar blocks project I showed you, which is still used, like as often like gets passed around on Instagram and so forth. And so I think um, that's one way. I think that, you know, it really depends on what your organization is. Like I know that I work with a lot of organizations that do housing issues and um, they often show interactive maps or use interactive maps when they're meeting with the with their communities to better explain um, some of the trade-offs towards like development projects. Um, and that's, you know, using data in that way to ex explain the trade-offs is can be really impactful community engagement and that it really helps to educate the community and break down knowledge barriers for them to be able to make important decisions about the places they live in. But I think that can happen both through these kind of interactive visualizations, but, but also static ones as well. I think the interactive ones are better because it allows uh, the communities to find their own voice within the data set. Um, but I would say we have, you know, organizations that do this more than others. Like we have like this group organization called Policy Link. That's you know, in fact, um, the head of their data group just um, wrote a book about data visualization, um, and um, so they do that quite often. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, I feel like each city in the US has their own like kind of data visualization group now that either works with GIS or other kind of ways of making community engagement. Um, we have um, like, um, um, like a version of AmeriCorps which is focused on technology and community engagement um, as well. Can I jump in with a, a um... Uh, related question, I guess they're all related. Um, I'm really interested in the parts of your work where you're talking about building um, data literacy and building skill sets among people who are, um, who you know, communities who are engaging with the data. And, and 
um, clearly some of the work is is very complex and you know um, just thinking about the ghost cities example some of that analysis at the analytic side of things analysis can be quite complex um, using complex mathematics or um, modeling or measuring um, to what extent uh, what are some of the what are some of the tools or or um, I guess techniques that you you use or um, know of that that help to bro to to build um, skills? What are the the kind of um, yeah range of things that can be done to to improve data literacy and in that sense a, across the community? Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many great tools out there to get started with data, everything from like Tableau, uh, um, which is a great, like I think beginner school if you wanna start working with data or be even advanced in some ways. Um, there's Plotly, which is also a great tool for like data visualizations and like um, putting data together. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's also like other mapping tools like CardoDB and Kepler that make it really easy to make maps so easy um, that like almost anyone could take like their census data and put it, put it on a map. So I think there's a lot of like great mapping tools. I think though, you know, in terms of like data literacy, it's about, I, I would say data literacy is about the ability to make arguments with data um, and I feel like while we have a lot of these tools available um, to make let's say like a data map or bar chart we don't always have the skills to make the arguments that we need and so I think that's you know something that really <coughs> building the teams excuse me <coughs> building the teams help with like in that okay I might be able to make this map and chart my data, like what does it mean in the world? Um, and through like editing with your collaborators, it helps kind of build those school skills and arguments as people test you and push you um, to try to move those arguments forward with the data sets that you have. But I'm just thinking like if I was a complete novice, like I wanted to use data, I would totally go to Kepler or RGB or Tableau and start experimenting um, in that way. Um, I do think that if you've never used data in, in your life, like how do you get help? Um, there's so many great meetup groups that um, help with thinking about data and data literacy um, that help um, with, you know, there's even a Kepler meetup group to like make maps. And so for those that aren't within an academic community, I do think there's a lot, we're lucky that we live in um, the, the world we live in right now where we have lots of ability to reach out for help through these different groups and organizations. Even policy link that I mentioned often helps organizations and advises them like either on a nonprofit or like collaborative way. And we have lots of organizations in the US that are specifically focused um, on helping organizations build their data skills um, and do consulting and consultancy work along those lines in the hopes that they can build the skills. They don't want them to become dependent on them, but it, they are really to transfer that knowledge. Yeah. Um, look, I'm just uh, conscious of the time. We've just hit 10.30 all of a sudden. It just crept up on me. Um, so I'd, I'd, um, I'd like to thank you, Sarah, um, deeply for your insights and, and sharing them with us. Um, and thank you to everyone who came along and the questions. Um, we we'll, Obviously, we'll have more as we go, and hopefully we'll be able to keep these kind of links um, open in terms of our collaboration around um, working with data and data in action and the organisations that we work with here in Australia. Um, it's been great to get your insights. Um, I just remind everyone that um, we have another of, of this series next week with Julia Stojanovic from New York University, looking at um, AI and 
um, engagement, public engagement in, in AI and machine learning um, more specifically. And, and I think that follows on nicely from what you've spoken about, Sarah. So thank you again um, from us and thank you everyone for coming. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Everybody. Thanks, it was everyone. Great chatting with you. Have All a right. nice evening. You have a nice day, everyone. <laughs> Cheers. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.